Hello everyone and welcome back. Today's short story is Dominion, written, illustrated, and read by Jan Cutforth Wu. That's me. A dark day, Thursday, 4th February, 1886. Winter was in full force and it was bloody cold. Isabella Sophia was deathly ill and could not get out of bed. Her husband Ashland brought her some tea. He did not feel well either. He was hot and sweating. He walked up the long stairway to her room, carrying the tea on a silver tray. He could feel his head swimming. What the hell was wrong with him? After all, his life was great. He had it all. Two beautiful boys. Well, three if Clifton did not die at one year old. Frank was the baby just five years old, and Daniel was a busy eight-year-old. And of course, the two girls, Ellen, 10, and Clara, eight though Clara and Daniel were not twins. Ellen and Daniel were Ashland's secret children he'd had with his mistress, Cecilia. He wondered again, what the hell was wrong with him? Isabella lay in a huge down-filled bed soaked with fever and lifeless pallor. What the hell was wrong with her? These were troubled times in England. People were dying and no one really knew why. Ashland thought they should get out of there, but how could they leave their estate and all that they had? No one could take care of the many acres of farmland that they had better than he could. And after all, it was for his son, Frank, to inherit, who, while the youngest of all his children, was his first legitimate boy. Ashland felt sick. He sat next to his frail wife, Isabella Sophia, who had been at his side for 13 years. He raised the porcelain cup to her thin, pale lips. It was then that she passed, sadly, trying to sip the tea. 1890, Burlamarsh. Frank, now nine years old, was out riding his delightful Shetland pony, running, jumping, galloping, and pretending that he was hunting for fox, just like his father, Ashland. Clara, Frank's sister, could see him from where she was nervously trying to stay out of sight. She stood just inside the manor next to the large doors at the drawing room. She knew that there was something terribly wrong and did not want to leave the house, even though Frank looked to be having the time of his life. Their father, Ashlyn, had opened the front door to a strange woman and her two children and asked them to step into the drawing room where the strange lady was saying some very disturbing things to him. She was demanding that he help her and their children. Ashlyn, it's time you took me seriously and our children too. You cannot expect us to live like paupers when you are this bloody rich. Her shrill tone sent shivers down Clara's spine. She could never possibly look at her father the same again. Clara ran through the long, dark hallway, straight out the grand front doors and started to cry, first a tear at a time, and then what seemed like a river or an ocean. She just stood there at the massive entrance of the Burla Marsh Manor for a very long time. Who were those strangers in her house claiming to be part of her family? It didn't make any sense. What's wrong? Frank asked in his young voice. Nothing. Clara wiped away the wet from her face on the back of her white silk sleeve. Not nothing. I can see you're crying. Why are you crying, Clara? Is something wrong, wrong with father? I don't know, was all she could squeak out. August 1891, a very bad summer. There she was, Aunt Sarah, Ashland's sister, the stout aunt in her expensive velvet and leather suit, all gray and black. She had seagull eyes that matched her shock of reddish gray hair. Frank felt like she was sent by the devil. She was so cold. He wondered if she even had a soul. Come along, young man. We have business to take care of, was all she said. Frank, who was very young at 10 years old, wondered what she meant. Come in here, she said. The drawing room was cold with red curtains. Green walls and heavy dark oak furniture was all around. Now both your parents are gone. First your poor mother just a few years ago and now your father finally taken by that long illness. It is our responsibility. Responsibility, that's a big word, thought Frank. Frank was awash with difficult feelings that his mother and father were laying together in the cold stone crypt in Orby Chapel. What would Aunt Sarah have to say that could put his tender broken heart at ease? It is my job to take care of you and your sister Clara. Now that your mother and father are dead, she put it bluntly. Dead, dead, what? Frank was scrambling for his thought. Yes, dead, he knew. He'd seen them at their funerals. He 
hopelessly sobbed. Then everything happened fast. The next day, Frank could hear their voices behind the drawing room's closed doors, discussing and planning as he stood behind a wooden table. He peeked through the tiny crack between the doors into the room and listened intently to the voice, voices of Aunt Sarah and Uncle George. It's tomorrow then, George, the mean old woman squawked. Tomorrow, said Uncle George as he puffed his pipe with all his breath. Off to Canada with him then. Yes, Canada. Farm over there will be the best place for him. Ashland's last will and testament will not even be read until the kid is long gone. No one will be the wiser. And so Frank was put to bed that night and in the morning was dressed by his servant in his best little tan woolen suit with a clean, crisp, white, high collared shirt. He looked just like who he was, a very rich little boy. His sister Clara had secretly passed him her little leather bound book and a piece of hard pencil. She whispered, please write. He slipped the book and pencil into his jacket pocket. There was no effort made even to try to pack any of his belongings into a trunk. He did not know it, but he would never see his room or his treasures again. Driven by horse and carriage to the seaside and the port with the ship that would take him to Canada, little Frank did not know that his father had left him a large estate with an extraordinary sum of money. This was only for Ashland's sister Sarah to know and for her and her husband George to spend as they would. At age 10, Frank had no idea of the wealth that he'd just lost to his greedy relations. Frank stood at the dock with his father's lady, Cecilia, who had somehow mysteriously replaced his own mother, Isabella, just the summer before. She was holding his little hand in the cold Atlantic air. The smell of the sea in his tiny nostrils was pungent and he could feel the moisture settle on the fuzz on his lip. Many people, including a large group of boys who looked to be about Frank's age, were moving all around him. He held Cecilia's hand tight so he would not lose her in the crowd. Frank was afraid. He felt frozen and not from the stiff summer wind that was whipping his hair. Crates of fish and cargo were all around him as he stood in his woolen knickers and suit jacket. He placed his other hand firmly on the little notebook secure in his jacket pocket and in his heart he held his deep bleeding pain. He was facing uncertainty and even at 10 he knew it. He hated his aunt, his uncle, but most of all he hated the replacement mother, Cecilia. He felt all her evil and he wished that she would just vaporize. Cecilia flagged down a man she called Dr. Bernardo. He wore a tired looking black suit and a weary top coat and looked to be in charge of a group of boys on the dock. She spoke to the man, but the wind was ringing so loud in Frank's ears that he could not understand a word they were saying. And then with a swift motion, the man took Frank by the arm and stood him in front of the camera. Poof. His picture would be the only evidence that he had just become one of many British home children. Then he was whisked away from Cecilia and placed in front of the row of boys who were now lined up in the front of the SS Numidian ship for another epic photo. As part of the newly formed herd of boys, Frank was hustled onto the Allen Shipping Company ship, the Numidian, on Thursday the 20th of August 1891. The ship that he would spend a long time on, 10 very long days before he would arrive in Quebec. He clenched his teeth as the man with the huge beard asked him his name and then told him to sign the passenger list. Frank signed his name with the keen precision of a child. He was then briskly pushed along by the passenger list man. He'd never been shouted at with such nasty words before in his life. Get along, you dirty little rat, the passenger list man had branded Frank. I'm not dirty. I'm not a rat, Frank shouted inside his head. This was a horrible first for him, but most certainly would not be the last. He was in absolute shock and confusion that he had just been abandoned by Cecilia, that, uh, that he was still scrambling to put the situation into perspective. All he could think about was getting back to Burla Marsh and his sister Clara. What will happen to Clara if Cecilia did this to me? He burst out crying right then and there. I need to speak to someone, he shouted through his heaving sobs, but everyone just ignored him. I should not be on this boat, he yelled again in panic. Frank was swiftly pushed forward in a crush of passengers, all boarding the steerage class. He figured there were hundreds of people, of which the group of boys with Dr. Bernardo were only a small part. Who was this doctor? 
How had Cecilia been so quick to dump Frank off with him? Cecilia seemed to know the doctor somehow, but how? To Frank, the doctor had surfaced as if he were the devil himself. They were all still outside the large lower deck of the SS Numidian when it started to rain. No one had an umbrella. Some people were trying to cover their worn out trunks and suitcases. Frank only had the clothes on his back and he was instantly worried that the sooty rain would soil his jacket. He did not want to look unkempt so that the people who might help him could see that he was a good little boy and not a dirty little rat like the passenger list man had called him. You should stop crying, an older boy in his teens leaned down and spoke in Frank's ear so that he could hear over the noise of so many people. That Bernardo guy will beat you silly with his cane if he catches you crying. Well, why would he do a thing like that? The older boy's warning shocked Frank so much he stopped sobbing immediately. That's better. He slapped Frank on the shoulder. My name is Walter Harold O'Cleary, he stated proudly. Who are you? I am Frank Edward Quincy from Burla Marsh in Orby. Frank straightened up and plucked up the courage to put on a brave face as he straightened his jacket. Well, Orby, pleased to meet you, Walter smiled warmly at the obviously frightened Frank. And so it was that Frank would be known as Orby, at least for the rest of the overseas journey. Stick with me and I'll watch out for you. They were slowly herded toward the large bay doors to the steerage interior. Frank felt sick to his stomach and let one or, more two, one or two more tears well up in his big hazel eyes that looked nearly emerald green when he was that upset. He felt like one of the calves at Burla Marsh when his father and the workers would push them into the branding corrals. Once inside the steerage area, the stench of so many people in such a high humidity and no sea breeze began to intensify almost immediately. For Frank, the putrid air wrapped around him like tentacles, squeezing him so hard that he, all he could feel was crushing despair. He was overwhelmed by the weight of being abandoned, and it was just inconceivable that he was all alone. Walter nudged him gently forward by the shoulder. Come on, Orby, we need to get the bottom bunks. Hot air rises, if you know what I mean. Frank did not know what he meant, but he guessed that it had to do with the crowding of hundreds of dirty people and the smells that were already approaching vile. Here. Sit down here, Walter emphatically pointed to the small lower bunk he had raced to plunk himself down on. He was staking out their small piece of territory so that they were closest to the big doors when they were open and so that they could get outside on the lower deck whenever that would be afforded to them, which as it turned out was limited to one hour per day and only in good weather. Frank curled into an inconsolable ball on the hard bunk beside Walter. He silently sobbed until it was dark all around him and he had no more tears. As the great ship creaked and heaved on the rough sea in the dark, he took out the little notebook and in pencil he wrote, Dear Clara, my new friend Walter tells me we're going to God's country, but we have to travel through hell to get there. When I get to his country, I will ask God to help me find my way home. Your loving brother, Frank. Thanks everyone. If you enjoyed this short story, please like, comment, subscribe.